Lecture 22 of ECE 503. And so in today's lecture, what we're going to be looking at is the, the concept of windowing. All right? So um, let's motivate this a little bit. So what does windowing mean? So this idea of windowing um, forms around this idea that suppose you have some data, um, and you, um, or in this case in particular, you have some sort of target frequency that um, response that you want to convert into the time domain, but suppose that that transformation in time domain results in something that goes from minus infinity to infinity, or something really massive that I don't want to deal with, like you know tens of thousands of samples. So what I want to do is I want some way to potentially maybe gracefully truncate it, right? So uh, how do I mean? So let let's go to drawing because I love drawing. Um, so suppose I have some sort of desired frequency response. So I re represent it as HD of omega. And then I convert it, let's say, take the inverse Fourier transform, I get HD of N, right? But it turns out that this guy here has samples that go potentially from minus infinity to plus infinity, and that could be a problem, right? Suppose I only want a portion of that data to, to deal with at any given time. So where would this be useful in? Well, suppose I want to do some sort of like, I want to take data and characterize only a segment. So suppose I'm only interested in looking at this data, like uh, of interest, and ignore the rest. or Suppose I want to look at one segment after another segment after another segment, and at the same time, I want to sort of see the information from the previous segment kind of dovetail in the current segment and such. So there are a variety of different ways of doing that, but this can be achieved by a process called windowing. And what windowing does is exactly that. I only focus, let's say, let's say this is my area of interest. I use a window. I use a window in order to select a finite range of samples. All right? And there are a variety of different windows, and you probably have seen of a few. But um, each one has its both its advantages and disadvantages, which we'll look at right now. Okay? In fact, uh, we're going to use MATLAB in order to look at it, because my, my drawing skills are as you can tell, I'm just a naturally born artist. So, what windowing does is it truncates, let's say, a um, sequence potentially that's of infinite length or something very large into something that is of a size that I can deal with and I want to process. And so the way I would attempt that is I would take that data, let's say, here's like, let's say, that desired impulse response, but it could be of infinite length, and I multiply it against the window. So here's an example that's kind of poorly drawn of uh, what I mean. So you have, let's say, that HD of N, and it goes from minus infinity to infinity, and then I multiply it by, in this case, a rectangular window, such that at the end of the day, I only get this portion, and everything else is zeroed out. OK, that I do need to draw. Okay. So we go back to this example. So this is my HD of N. Okay. And that goes from minus infinity to plus infinity. And this is N. And suppose I'm only interested in, suppose, this range. Okay. What do I do? I multiply that this case, with something called WN. And that's my window. And with the window, let's say I choose something that's rectangular. Okay, What a rectangular window is going to look like is something like this. It's going to be flat. 
It's zero elsewhere. So here it's zero, and there is zero. And this is of unity height. Okay. And when I at multiply the two together, what do I get? Well, whenever I multiply something with zero, it's going to be zero. And whenever I multiply something with a one, it's going to be whatever that value is. So what I'm going to get at the end of the day is HD of N times WN. And it's going to be zero, zero, zero. And then all of a sudden, doot, doot, doot. And everything else. So th this is the you know region of interest, region of interest, and the rest. And this is what our windowed impulse response looks like. Looks like in this case, right? And that's just one type of window. And it really depends on what sort of application you're going to be using this in. So rectangular windows are great if you just want this segment of data and nothing else. right? There are other types of windows which we'll look at. And I'm going to run them through uh, MATLAB right now. Okay? So let's keep that for now. Okay? And, and the reason why we have different types of windows is essentially that transition. Actually, let's let's go let's actually let's go back to this guy. So this is actually something that folks might be interested in, which is look at the transition here and here. In the case of a rectangular window, the transition is kind of abrupt. It's like you might have nothing in terms of impulse response, and then boom! What happens is you all of a sudden have signal come out of nowhere, right? And so the rectangular windows is renowned for having no uh, gradual transition. Instead, what happens is you have essentially like um, uh, whatever the data is. And you know, let's say here, luckily, for some oddball reason, when I drew this, you actually have something where the waveform or whatever, this impulse response kind of low and then gradually gets large. But suppose, on the other hand, I had something that was quite large in value at those edges of that window. What's going to look like is essentially nothing, 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 and then a sudden increase and such. And so in some applications, especially if you're looking at data, like let's say one set of data followed by another set of data after another set of data, what you may want to do instead What you may want to do instead is have something called a taper. So what a taper is, is your window has a built-in weighing function. So in order to avoid that big abrupt change from nothingness into something, right? what you have is something that sort of takes at a very low amplitude whatever is kind of at the edge of the desired region that you want to play with, and it weighs it. And then increasingly lets it get larger and larger and larger, and then you plateau to the actual region of interest. So what this does is you don't end up having a sudden increase, a sudden, all of a sudden, a high bunch of stems, but rather it gradually increases. And like you know, an, an example of that would be something where you have an operation. So let's get rid of this. So suppose you have this. You have data, okay, and suppose you're interested in this region, this region, this region. So suppose, like ever so often, you're doing this processing, okay, and you want to apply a window. If you do a rectangular window, what are you going to get? So let's say you do region 1, region 2, region 3, region 4, right? And so if we draw it out, I'm going to try that. What will happen is you've got this, and then an abrupt end. You're going to have this, you're going to have this, 
And then, of course, boom, all of a sudden this just appears, right? And so that assumes that we're using a rectangular window on these regions. Now, and then as a result, these sort of sudden transitions, sudden transitions, uh, they look kind of large, right? So, and it will be reflected in the windowed region for a rectangular window. So instead, what some folks use, and I'm going to use a different color just to highlight it. Yes, let's keep it. Let's use black. Okay, fine. I don't know. Well, I have to admit the feet here. So instead, if I use something like this, this type of window, so it has a taper and transitions into the next region, and then you have another taper, and then you have another taper, tapered window. And so what you're doing is instead you have this. Right? So you kind of go to zero, uh, from zero, and you go back to zero. No sudden transition in the, wi in, in the window. Same thing here. You have this. You also have the previous guy. Right? And then you're getting bigger. Then you have that. Right? Here, well, it, there wasn't much signal to begin with. Right? And then you go back to zero. But this guy will actually be very useful because then you'll have do, 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 do. Right? So this is the impact of the taper. So what ends up happening is you kind of incorporate, you, you transition from the previous region to the next region so it's not a sudden change. And what it also does is you actually reach out into, let's say, if you, if let's say you want to take into account some of the information from the previously windowed region, you would do that as well. So what ends up happening is you have a nice transition and you also account for, although weighed less, some of the data from outside the desired regions, such that you kind of don't have like, oh, where did that information come from? So there's a little bit of continuity, all right? And there are a variety of windows that accomplish that. Like, so for instance, there is something called um, uh, the, the uh, uh, rectangular window, the Bartlett, of course, Hanning, Hamming, and Blackman. So, um, you know, you can do this in, uh, there's a table in your textbook that shows these, but let's, let's actually look at MATLAB. So I had a little bit of fun while you guys were doing your quiz. So, um, let me see. So usually when I'm in MATLAB, I do help window, and it tells you about a variety of different ones. So you have a rectangular window, so uh, where is it? Rectwin. Okay. So let's say I do, um, let's say 65, a width of 65 samples, and I do rectwin. Okay. And then ew, I do stem w. And no surprise. It's going to be 65 stems of height 1. That's your window. Shouldn't be a surprise, right? On the other hand, um, suppose I want to do Bartlett. Right, that's another type of window. Also of 65 elements. And then I stem. And Bartlett is essentially triangular, triangular window. And you can go through all these different types. So my favorite is there's Hanning and there's Hamming. The difference is they both are kind of like half cosine periods stitched together, but Hamming is on a pedestal. Yes? Oh, okay. No, it's okay. I thought you had a question. So there's Hamming. I'm just going to do stem W right after that. Oh, oh, yeah. So Hamming is, has a pedestal and otherwise looks like half of a cosine and then the other half of a cosine. Hanning with N, not M, so be careful with that phone name, um, does not have that pedestal. Okay? 
So notice that that one does not have the pedestal. And then there's a few others, like <coughs> some folks love Blackman window. So let's okay. So so these are just a, a one of a, a variety of different windows. But notice that you can do a, a different types of transitions in each one of these guys. Um, and again, you can find out more by just typing in uh, help window. So there's like a variety, like you know the uh, you know Kaiser window, hand window, and a, and, a, and a few others. Oh, two key, two key window. So that's my favorite. So um, from that, you can uh, you know you, you have these different types. And then also what happens is we often care about not only the time domain but also the frequency domain response of these windows. Um, in particular, what we want to know is what we call the main lobe bandwidth. So, so what ends up happening is uh, with these windows, if we take the frequency response, if we take the frequency response, it's going to have something that looks like this, right? And this is in the log domain, right, the magnitude. And then this is normalized frequency. And what we're really interested in is that first main lobe bandwidth. Right? And so what ends up happening is if you notice, like more and more, like each one of these guys, first of all, there's a main lobe bandwidth, and then there's the peak of the first side lobe. And so if, uh, some, the goal in a lot of cases is we want that peak to be as small as possible. We want basically the energy to be con con concentrated in the main lobe and the side lobe to be as small as possible. And that's why folks look at Blackman, because minus 7 dB is pretty darn low relative to, let's say, a rectangular window, which is like 19, minus 13 dB. Okay. And again, you, uh, table 10.1 in your textbook does a great job of uh, giving you all these cool windows and their diagrams. Actually, let me, let me try something. Uh, I'm wondering if it's just going to be dumb luck or anything. But um, what, So which window did I do? Oh, I did that. Okay. So if I plot ABS FFT W 1024, what do we get? What? Ah. If I only knew what an FTT was. There we go. And then, oh, oh, my bad. And then what I also want to do is uh, ABS, and then I want to take 10 dot times log 10 of this guy. Yeah, so that's, this is what I was like looking for. Of course, I want to normalize the frequency range as well. So this is 65, but what we're really interested in is like you have your main lobe width, and then you, also, then you have like the first and second and third side lobes afterwards. And each one of these guys will produce something different. So in fact, let me see. If I, so let's really play here. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to define, actually, uh, it's going to error, so that's fine. Uh, 0, 1, 10, 23. And what I'm going to do uh, in real time is I'm going to put x, and I'm going to specify each window. So window, you have rect win, um, should be at rect win. And so let's say we try um, 100, OK? <coughs> That's right? OK. And yes, OK. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to just cut and paste a few more times. Oh, yeah. <coughs> See, this is why I don't like coding in real time. Let's make this guy red. We'll make him blue. And what we're going to do here is we're going to choose something like Hanning. Um, and then here, we can use Hamming.
and we'll make him green. And last but not least, Blackman. I decided not to do two key. Okay. There we go. So what we've got here is for the same order, you have you have the following. So I ah, sorry. So what you have here is let's zoom in on these guys. Yeah. I want to change the range. You have different windows that are all being applied. Uh, let me do that. There we go. So uh, I forgot what the sequence was, but essentially you have a combination of either the main lobe width and uh, actually I think I can do the hand. Ah, there we go. I learned something new. So what we've got is, and again, these things are not normalized in both frequency and, and magnitude, but what you have is you have different main lobe widths. You have very different peak, um, peak side lobe heights. And, and what you notice is that the, the characteristics of each one of these are different um, because, uh, and, and, and some of them are designed specifically to satisfy, just like what we saw in lecture 22 here, the slide, um, to achieve either a very low peak side lobe level or maybe as narrow uh, a, a bandwidth as possible. And, Rick, and so there's a, there is a trade-off between the two. But physically, when you graphically look at it, so I'm just have to remember which one is which. So red is rectangular, blue is Hanning, green is Hamming, and Blackman is yellow. So yellow is not coming out so well. So yeah, with yellow, you've got the maximum main lobe width, but you also have the, 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 short, the lowest of the side lobe height. And then red, on the other hand, you have the highest in terms of the side lobe uh, height, but you also have the narrowest of all the main lobes as well, and then you have everything in between. So, in fact, if you go back, the, hand, the, the main difference between the Hanning and the Hamming, why we have that pedestal, is actually shown here. What you've got is you have the green, which is the Hamming, and you have the blue, which is the Hanning. And what, what makes all the difference is that tiny little pedestal. With that pedestal, Notice what happens with the, si the peak side lobe height between green and blue. It's much less. So what happens is uh, you have the same main lobe width, but because of that tiny little addition of that pedestal, you actually get, you actually achieve a lower side lobe level uh, than, than you would with the Hanning. So just potpourri, FYI. All right. Isn't MATLAB cool? So, um, going back to lecture 22. So this, this was kind of like the, um, um, uh, you know, some of the trickery that I showed you. So, you know, try this at home. Try the other windows, like how does Tukey look like and, and such. And more of this, more details, I would recommend that you read is in section 10.2.3 of your textbook. Now what we're going to do is we're going to switch gears a little bit. And what we're going to look at is not necessarily windowing per se, but we're going to look at um, FIR filters that are linear phase and very importantly, equi-ripple. So remember last class, we looked at uh, FDA tool, right, as a way of designing your, your, your filters. And in particular, we looked at, we looked at, um, um, uh, we, we tried out equi-ripple. So we talked about the anatomy of a filter where we had a pass band, we had a, a stop band, we have a transition, we have pass band ripple, we have stop band ripple, and it's, it's, it, what we want to strive for in this case is, uh, in a lot of cases, we want to have a pass band and stop band ripples, uh, 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 deviations that are approximately equal and cannot, and cannot be independently controlled. Like, you know, that's, that's the one part. So we really do want that. Um, to be independently controlled. And then the second thing is that the ripples are not uniform in either the pass band or stop band. So what we need is can we develop a filter that where the stop band ripple and the pass band ripple can be independently controlled. So remember FDA tool last week? I could actually control what my pass band and my stop band ripples were. I defined these weights. And those weights 
are going to be visited right now. And the other thing is, we want to have those ripples uniform across each band. Again, what this will make us think is, okay, how do we achieve that? What do we do? And so what we want to do is we want to come up with a routine for developing a linear phase equiripple design. And to do that, what we need to do, first of all, is we take the frequency response of the filter we want to design, and we break it up into the magnitude and phase response. Now, what do we know about linear phase filters, or the systems in general? So what we have is we have an amplitude that's all real value, and we have a complex phase. What we want to do is we want that h. If it's going to be linear phase, it's symmetric, right? Remember, one of the properties of linear phase in the time domain, our filter is going to be symmetric. So in order to achieve that symmetry, our amplitude, our amplitude will actually consist of, when we do the Fourier transform, it's actually going to be like a discrete Fourier transform, right? Does everyone remember like what happens if we take Let's say the amplitude, we take, let's say, forget about this guy for now, this phase, and we only focus on the ANs. And what we want to do is if we take those guys, and, we, and in this case it almost looks like a cosine transform, what we want to do is we want to form AE to the J omega, the frequency response of the amplitude, which is going to be real, and we know that the, the, the discrete Fourier transform will actually become, because of that symmetry property, right? Because it's a linear phase, our an at a0 is going to be identical if we flipped it across you know, the, x, the y axis, is going to be identical at the other end of that sequence. Because of that symmetry, we can actually transform everything into a cosine transform. And we saw that before. And what we want to do is once we have this format, we can rewrite cosine k omega in terms of something called the Chebyshev polynomial. Again, now this is getting complicated, right? It's almost like mathematical induction. Um, so what ends up happening is we can translate cos of k omega into this Chebyshev polynomial of order k. And then from that, we can rewrite that expression to give us this, this a e to the j omega. This is desired, right? No, sorry. No, no, no. I take that back. a e to the j omega is not desired. a e to the j omega is what we actually get. That's what, that's what we can actually design using our filter. a d e to the j omega, that's the desired amplitude response. That's the equiripple, right? So AD, e to the j omega is desired. A, e to the j omega is what we get. So all those coefficients, all those A's, in this case, um, alpha K, right? The alpha K, which comes from here, right, from the AK, that's what we can actually control and a d e to the j omega is the desired amplitude response. Now, what we want to do is we want to figure out how can we define the error? What's the difference between actual and desired? And the answer is you take the two responses, the actual amplitude response and the desired one. You subtract the two off together, and then you weigh it for that frequency. So you have a weighing function, w multiplied by it, and this gives us something called e to the e j omega. This is called our approximation error. So what we did is we came up with a frequency response that describes to us how much we're off between the actual defined by the alpha k's, alpha k's? Yes, alpha k's and the desired a d e to the j omega. So did we choose the alpha case just right? Are we close enough? Are we way so far away we have to try again? And so 
the op this now translates into an optimization problem. This translates into something like in that expression with the little star, what we're trying to do is, so we have a min and we have a max, and that might be confusing. What does this mean? We try and find the frequency, we try and find the frequency for that error function, right, the approximation error, that yields the largest error. And then we try and minimize, right? So what we do is we try and, so, so what we try and do is we find the frequency that has the largest error, and then we select the coefficients, the AKs, that give us, that minimize that largest error, right? So what happens is, what do we have in control? What, as engineers, what do we have in control? We can define what the desired looks like, but we can only really manipulate the coefficients, AK, to get something done. So we find the worst case error across frequency, and then we tweak, or we select, or we design the AKs to minimize that guy. Okay? So we're not going after an error that's eh, not the largest, and we're trying to, we're basically tackling the worst possible error, the difference between the A and the AD, frequency response, and then we design it with the, uh, we choose the best possible coefficients and minimize it. So what we're going to look at in lecture 23 is the algorithms for accomplishing this. And that's Parks McClellan, okay? So that concludes lecture 22. Ooh, good time.